We are now live from Yukon, Oklahoma. And the first thing we do as we start our class is we prepare ourselves for Sunday school class. Your preparation is a time of uh, analyzing your life and your heart. Make sure you're in right fellowship with the Father. Because as you study the Bible, you want to make sure that you get maximum amount of uh, spiritual insight. And that comes when you're in fellowship with the Father. If you have committed any sin, be it overt or covert, that means outward sins or inward in the mind sins. Either way, the scripture tells us in 1 John 1, 9 that we can confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you, each of you are a private priest unto the Lord. You have an opportunity to go before the Father and to confess sin if you need to. If you don't need to, you can wait for the rest of us to catch up to you. <laughs> and it's a time also of being filled with spirit. You know, when we study the Bible, if you do it just under your own human effort, you can get some benefit from it. But you don't get the spiritual benefit that the Holy Spirit wants to give you until you are filled with the Spirit and under the Spirit control. When the Holy Spirit controls you, then the Holy Spirit is your teacher, not Curtis and not a commentary you might be reading, but let the Holy Spirit be the one that teaches you. So we want to be filled with the Spirit. And then the third part here is there's a lot of distractions each and every day. And sometimes we even wonder about, okay, what's going to happen on Monday? Our brain starts to you know, go off and look at other things. So instead, let's do some self-discipline. This is a time to refocus, focus on the scriptures. We're here for less than an hour, but during that hour, it may make the whole difference for your entire week, preparing you for what God wants to show you. So focus on the scriptures this morning, and we'll use this time now to pray, and we'll start in a moment. Father, thank you very much for the fact that we can come before you as private priests and we can confess sins to you and that you are faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to also give us the Holy Spirit to, to train us and teach us and lead us into a way that you want us to go. We pray, Lord, that this morning as we're studying your scriptures, that it be a, a time of revelation, a time of application, and may you be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're continuing our excursion for a little while. If you remember, uh, we're in 1 Thessalonians. We finished up chapter 2. We're getting ready to start chapter 3. But I said, hey, let's take a few moments here on this journey. And let's take some side trips and get a little bit more background and detail on um, doctrines that will become important to us as we study in Thessalonians. So the excursion that we're going through... If you remember here, we went over the blessed hope and the wedding ceremony, what that means and how it relates back to uh, the rapture. Then we talked about the mystery of the resurrections, and we're going to come back to that later. We did some uh, lessons on the science of immortality and what's going to happen to our bodies, that when we are resurrected, our bodies will get uh, glorified and changed. We talked about that some more. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the church and Israel, and we're doing that because the rapture is dealing with the church. And we need to understand, is there a, a change or a difference between Israel and the church? And what are the doctrines around that? That will lead us into next week. We're going to study the, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we're going to, uh, multiple times we've had teachers come in and teach us about the 70th week of Daniel. But I'm going to show it to you a slightly different way. And uh, I think that you'll find that interesting because it also then it will answer some questions about what's this idea about um, the tribulation and is, is, a, is the snatching away before the tribulation, the middle of tribulation, after tribulation, is there a tribulation at all? So we're going to talk about some of that and answer some of your questions. And then that leads into the last part, which is the thousand year reign. Is that real or figurative? We're going to finish these things. So when we get into the rapture and into Thessalo uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, and 5, we'll understand what is the purpose of all of this. And that's why we're giving you some, some background. All right. So while we're going through this, be sure that you take notes 
and ask questions, okay? And for our guests, we want to welcome you. And it, it is a, uh, this, this study sometimes can get a little strange because we will talk about things that uh, most uh, Bible teachers don't want to deal with. It takes too much thinking. But I believe that each and every one of us have the Holy Spirit. We can dig deeper into the scriptures and we can get more out of it. If at any point in time you're completely confused, it's okay. A lot of us get confused before we get you know, our brains straightened out again. And that's okay. You can ask questions. So uh, particularly today when we're talking about the church and Israel and what does that mean. So first, let's talk about the church. All right, so we did a short study on the church earlier, if you guys remember, and some of you, no, I don't see anybody bringing their binder. Aren't you taking notes? Yeah, where's your binders? Oh, okay. All right. So they're holding up their binders now. Very good. All right. Well, the first thing we want to see here is that the New Testament teaches that the church age, which is the age we're in right now, is unique. Did you know that? Did you know that right now the age that you're living in is completely unique? It's never happened before in the past, and there's coming a time in which it won't happen again in the future. The church is a, a particular point of period in time, and you are living in that church age. So we're going to talk about what that means. It's critical because if you don't understand the church age, and you're not going to understand what's the purpose of the tribulation, what's the purpose of the rapture, what's the purpose of the millennium, etc. Because it deals back also with how God's handling Israel and how he's handling the church. And they're not the same. So we're going to get into that. So first of all, the church itself is a part of God's plan. It's always been a part of God's plan. It's not a plan B. Plan A being Israel and Israel messed up. And then plan B was the church. No, it's not that at all. There's always been the plan to have the church also. And we're going to see that it was a mystery and why. All right. So in eternity past, we call it eternity past because there's a period of time before the world was created, before material space and time was created, before all that. And we call that eternity in the past. And in the past, it says that God had a council. He came together and he created a decree. A decree is a plan. He had a plan for all of us. The Bible says before the foundations of the world, he planned and elected each of us. So there's something going on here way before even the world was created. And a part of that was this eternal plan involved also the church. All right. So, yes, please come on in. You all have to sit up. Oh, I see. You've got to sit in the back. Okay. All right. Well, uh, there's a, there, yeah, there's a tape right up here. All right. Excellent. So the church was always a part of God's eternal plan. All right. But this plan was a mystery. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. It was revealed in the New Testament. And um, I was just reading in a modern, uh, modern version of the Bible, and it called it the secret. There was a secret. There was a mystery. And the church is the mystery. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. So people who are reading the Old Testament, they're like, there's nothing in here. No prophecies. There's nothing about the church. 100% hidden. We need to understand that. And it, it becomes uh, very important soon as we get further into this doctrine, why it was hidden. All right? So, the church uniqueness is one of the major reasons that supports the doctrine of the rapture. When you start to understand what is the church, the major reason for this rapture idea. Now, we are teaching at a Southern Baptist church. So the doctrines that I teach here are Southern Baptist doctrines. But I've done research on it all the way back to the first couple hundred years of the church. 
And we see that the first couple hundred years of the church, the, the fathers of the church taught this. And then around 400 AD, it changed and more. And then for several, like over a thousand years, this doctrine wasn't taught. And then it returned again. It's like there was a dark age. We're going to understand what was going on during all this. But the uniqueness of the church is a critical doctrine. We're going to understand why in a moment. And we want to understand this before we get into the 70th week of Daniel. Because if you don't understand this, when you get to the 70th week of Daniel, it gets very confusing. Yes, go ahead. When did the church age start? That's a great question. It started on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. And that's called the birth of the church, on the day of Pentecost. So it was... Um, on the day of Pentecost, of um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, until now. And the, the church age will go from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, day of Pentecost, until the rapture. The rapture ends the church age. That's very surprising to a lot of people. Because what happens to other people who become believers? Are they not a part of the church? after the rapture you know so if you're if you're into uh your know, prophecy and stuff you know there's different ideas about all that and we're going to go we're going to cover those as we get into them in thessalonians but one of the concepts is the tribulation the time of jacob's troubles when israel in one day it says they'll all become believers does that mean they become members of the church no the church is different so we're going to understand that as we go through that all right, so what about that church being a mystery? Well, it's interesting because Paul reveals in Ephesians chapter 2. So let's all turn to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and in verse 15, it says here that uh, by uh, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So in Ephesians, Paul is teaching on this idea about Israel and the church. And he says, there's a time in which God decided to graft the two together. So uh, Israel and the church became one man in the body of Christ. So during the church age, if you are a Jew that became a believer, or if you're a Gentile that became a believer, both of those are now called something different. Because no longer are they being called Jews and Gentiles. And now they call the body of Christ. They merge into one. So with that understanding, let's go a little bit further to chapter 3. So in chapter 3, he's going to now reveal what is this mystery. So it's, it's something that has never existed before in the Old Testament. And... It is, uh, if you go to chapter 3, verse 2. So, <clears throat> at the top of my Bible in uh, chapter 3, it's got a, you know, it's not in the Bible as scripture, but it's in the Bible as, as a marking to let me know what the chapter is about. Mine says, the mystery of the gospel being revealed. So, and then it says, uh, I'll start with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, you uh, given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So, chapter uh, Ephesians three, chapter two, is all about this thing called the stewardship of this mystery. All right, you may have heard me tell you before that I am a person that believes in what's called the dispensations. Different periods of time, God's doing something different. Well, this word here for stewardship is where we get the word for dispensation. If, if you have a King James Bible, it will say dispensation. But stewardship is a special Greek word. If you're doing it with Strong's, it's in the Greek dictionary Strong's number 3622. And it's oikonomia. Oikonomia. And that means a household administration or a dispensation. So in, in the Greek days, 
if I had a big household, I would have a person who was in charge of being the steward of the house. And the steward of the house usually was a slave, but one that we trusted completely. And they had freedom to make decisions for the household. And they were called the administrator or the steward, the oi kononia of the home or the household. And they also were in charge of dispensing out what was going to be happening. So like if you had a youngster in the family that was not a slave, was a member of the family, and the, the oi kononia would be the one that took charge of your youngsters and dispensed out to them what their allowance was for the day and things like that. They were in charge of dispensing and administering the household. So it says here that Paul was given that role by God to uh, dispense out to us this mystery, this secret that was hidden from the Old Testament saints. It was not, it was, there was no prophecies about the church. It was a complete hidden mystery. And if you're a dispensationist like I am, we get our word from that one right there. Um, we believe that there is a, a time for each age when God is dealing with everybody and he deals with them differently. Uh, for example, during the age of Adam and Eve, oftentimes dispensationists might call that the age of innocence. There's a time, the period in which God is, is testing them with one test. And that test was whether or not they would obey him and not eat from that fruit of the, the, the knowledge of good and evil. And so they got tempted by Satan and they felt that temptation that ended that age. The next age started. All right. So there, there are a period of time where there's a test. Then there's an end of that age. And then the next age starts. And so like the age of, of Abraham. God called him out of the city of Ur and said, I want you to uh, come to a land that you've never been to before. He traveled across the deserts, went a long ways, got to the land of, of Canaan. And there he says that he started listening to God and God said, I'm going to make you into the father of many, many nations. You're going to be a blessing to the world. And the scripture says that Abraham believed him, believed those promises and that promise was what saved him. Isn't that weird? Wait a minute. I thought we had to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, it's believing in the promises that God's given you during the age in which you are in. And the revelation of Jesus is over a period of time. A lot of people don't realize that. That there is a, uh, a revelation that's progressive. And as we study the scriptures, we find out that Abraham believed. And then later, Paul tells us it was because of that belief in the promises that it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay, so he, God has like a bank account and says, uh, we're going to give you credit toward righteousness. And so we learn that Abraham was the father of the faith, the beginning of it. And, and those who are from the lineage of Abraham, which we call now Jews, those who came from him and from his sons, they also become believers by believing in the promise. But if they don't believe in the promise, they're not considered children of Abraham. Children of Abraham is a spiritual child. And so we learn that as we start to go through and, and as you study the book of Hebrews and others, we learn that. So as we get through these different, there are seven dispensations. We are considered to be in the sixth dispensation right now, which is the age of the church. Some people might call that the age of grace, but God's always saved by grace. It's always been by salvation by faith through his grace. But we're in the church age. The next age that comes after this is the millennial age. That's the age in which a thousand years reign of Jesus literally on the planet. So I told you in the beginning that as we study the scriptures, we take it literally unless it tells us that there's a figurative interpretation. Okay, so as, as a Baptist, we will take things as much literally as we can unless it tells us, like, uh, there are symbols, and it will explain the symbols for us also. So uh, as we take this um, revelation now, notice it says here in uh, Ephesians 3, uh, verse 3, it says that 
this, um, this mystery was made known to me by revelation. You cannot understand the mystery of the church by reasoning. It takes a revelation. And this revelation is from the Holy Spirit. It was given to Paul. Scripture tells us, it's really interesting, that even Peter had a hard time understanding some of the writings of Paul. He says, now I recommend that you read the writings of Paul, Peter told uh, in 1 Peter. He says, I recommend you read his writings, but you know, they are difficult. So, And we all agree, yeah, they are difficult. So as we go through here, we find that he had a revelation, but it's called a mystery. It's given to Paul, and it's a mystery. Why was it called a mystery? What is a mystery? So as you think of mystery, you probably think of like murder mysteries, right? You know, television mysteries where um, something's hidden and you have to get all the clues and hunt it down. Uh, I like Columbo. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Columbo fan. And, you know, I'm like, how does this guy do this, okay? Or, uh, you know, Pink Panther. He, he stumbles into, you know, solving things. That's not what a mystery is in the Bible. In ancient Greece, they used to have these things called mystery religions. They were, we would call them a cult today, but they were mystery religions where you had to go through a special ritual that was a secret ritual with secret handshakes, secret passwords, secret everything. And as you went through this ritual, you were initiated into the mysteries of that particular religion. And then, as you get further and further, more and more was revealed to you. And so soon, they called them the Gnostics. The Gnostics were people who said they had special knowledge, and from that knowledge, they could be like God. That's not biblical, but that's what was happening. A lot of Christians in those days were starting to do that too. The Christians were being sucked into these mystery religions. Well, Paul is using terminology that they would have already known. They would have learned these terms in these mystery religions. So when he uses the term mystery here, they're already familiar with that terminology. And it means the following. It is a secret that you have to be revealed to. You can't just solve it on your own. So the first mystery here, biblically speaking, a mystery is a divine truth that God did not disclose in the Old Testament, but he revealed it to the apostles and the prophets, and they are to proclaim it freely to everybody. It wasn't where you had to go through a special ritual to get the mystery revealed, like in those mystery religions. Instead, it was freely given to you as a part of the gospel. So let's look at, at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 here. It says, he gave me insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So we see here that this mystery that was hidden is now revealed to us through the apostles and through the prophets. What is that mystery? Well, that's a, one of the big questions that they would have been asking. Well, first of all, you got to realize you can't learn this by reasoning. Okay, it's got to be revealed to you. So what is the content of that mystery? We'll see if you can find it in your Bible. What's the content of the mystery? A little louder for me. Sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. Is that the content of the mystery? Yeah, that they are fellow heirs of the promise. So in verse 6 is the answer. Verse 6. So verse 6 sits in my uh, version here. This mystery is this, that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that is the content. If you want to know what is this mystery, 
that's it right there. He's telling them strictly right out in the open. So, say that again. Why is it best that the Old Testament people didn't know that? Why would they have been upset? But not only were they special, they were given a uh, directions from God that they were to share that specialness with the rest of the world. It says that the blessings that were given to Abraham was to be shared with the entire world. And they didn't. They kept it to themselves. But also, who is this a secret to besides the Old Testament? Yeah, it's a secret to the angels. Okay? All the heavens, it was a secret to them as well. No one understood this until God revealed it to Paul. We're going to see that here in Ephesians. Okay? So it's a secret. So we get that here now next, verse 10. It's a mystery even to the angels. God would use the church to teach his wisdom even to the heavenly principles and authorities. So let's look at verse 10 on that one. And my Bible says this, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Satan didn't know this. You know, uh, the fallen angels don't know this. The elect angels, those that stayed with God, didn't know about the church. The entire thing, you and I, are a mystery to them. As a matter of fact, it says that the, even the hosts of God watch us closely to learn about God's wisdom. Did you realize that? That you are being watched closely. As a church, those who are members of the church is what we're talking about. When I say you and I, I make the assumption everybody in this room is a member of the church. If you're not, it's okay. You might become one. Okay? But the point is this. This mystery was also hidden from angelic beings. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, is this some sort of preparation for them that they, and progressive humans to receive God's revelation? There's a lot in this plan here. We're going to keep on pulling it apart. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you plant the seed, they're not ready for it. You water the seed, they're not ready for it. And eventually maybe something blossoms, they're like, wow, that revelation I understand. That's right. So there's a progressiveness that may occur. But what's interesting here is that the church age is for a limited period of time. And so far, that limited period of time has taken up about 2,000 years. Okay? Out of the, all the lifespan of humans. <clears throat> but it says, I don't know if you get this. I don't know what your Bible says. But mine says the manifold wisdom. What do, you, what do your Bibles all say? Manifold? What in the world is manifold? What does that mean? <laughs> okay, I got to hear you again. To display his wisdom. Does anybody have an amplified Bible? Ken. All right, multifaceted wisdom. Manifold, display, multifaceted wisdom. What is multifaceted? A complete wisdom. Say it again. In countless aspects of his wisdom. Okay, when you look at a diamond, a diamond in the rough is usually not cut to show the manifold or the... Uh, multifaceted of the diamond. But when it's properly cut, suddenly it bursts out with lots of different colors. It has uh, a 
lots of facets to the diamond. This word here was the word used to describe a cut diamond that has multiple facets or light coming through it. God's wisdom, when we often look at his wisdom, we see it in one way. But when the angels looked at us, they no longer see the wisdom of, of God when they look at him, they look at us and they're seeing a whole new part of God's wisdom they never saw before. A secret. It's hidden. It's a mystery. And that's you and I, those who are members of the church. So, this mystery was the original part of the plan. It wasn't a secondary plan. It didn't come later because the Jews messed up. It was always a part of his plan. So we need, to, we need to see that. So look at verse 11 now. This was according to the eternal purpose that he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this was a part of the original plan. I have to emphasize that because there's a whole, oh, what can I say? It's a horrible thing. There's a large number of Christians who thought that the church came later to replace all of Israel. Okay? And we didn't. We're not a secondary plan. So, God has a single plan. He carried it out in stages. The first stage was related to Israel. The second stage was related to the church. I'm stopping that. I'm making it understood that there's definitely one plan. So now let's go a little bit further. Well, has the church then replaced Israel? See, as Baptists, we say no. But there is a large population of Christians who say yes. A large population. So let's talk about that. It's called replacement theology. You may have heard about that. In, in, as a scholar, we have a whole different term for it. But it's not one that you really want to memorize. Supersessionism. Okay, that word's like, okay, that means nothing to you guys. So replacement theology is easier to understand. They replacement theology is a theology that says the church is the new or true Israel permanently replacing or superseding Israel as the people of God. That idea, replacement theology, is what caused the Holocaust. Okay? This idea is the reason why the church in Germany did not fight against the Nazis. I know. Replacement theology is the reason why the Holocaust occurred. They weren't thinking of the Jews as God's special people. They were thinking of Christians as, and therefore they had no problem with the Nazis killing off the Jews. So this replacement theology is a cause of anti-Semitism. Is uh, there's a contemporary disdain today? You see it in the news of uh, modern state of Israel. People are like dumping on them. They don't see them as God's special people because of this idea called replacement theology. So, who believes in place? Re, excuse me. Who believes in replacement theology? Okay, I told you I was a dispensationalist. It means. We believe that God has a special plan for Israel. And God has a special plan for the church. But there's another group of theologians called covenant theologians. Covenant theologians believe that the church has superseded for all time national Israel. As the church is the only ones that give out the blessings of God. And that Israel does not anymore. That's covenant theology. You may not have heard of that term. But you may have heard it as... Um, Let's see, what are some other modern day terms you might hear about? Um, well, the whole group under Lutheran thought this. Lutherans were uh, replacement theology. Now, I've talked with my brother. He, he, uh, he's a Lutheran. He doesn't agree. He thinks that God's blessed the Israel, you know, Jews. But there's a whole group. There's a Reformed theology. Reformed theology teaches replacement theology. If you've ever heard of Reformed theology. Spool. Yeah, you know, I really like Sproul and his teaching. I mean, he passed away now, but I still listen to him on the radio. But he also taught replacement theology. 
Okay? Yeah, you kind of go, sometimes you might hear something that some of these folks say, and you're going, wait a minute, that don't sound accurate. But that's because also you've had some good teaching in the Baptist church. <laughs> but um, covenant theologians think that there's a replacement. There's no replacement. And it's important that we know this because we're going to get to the point where we're studying what happens to the church, which, by the way, if, they, if they're replacement theologians, they're still going up in the rapture. Okay, I'm not saying anything about the rapture with these guys. I'm saying, how are they treating Israel? The Bible tells us to treat them as God's special people. All right, so let's understand what's going on with this. So dispensationalists believe that the church is the current instrument God's using to bless this world. But God has a future time in which he will restore the nation Israel as the institution for administering his divine blessings. Now, in 1948, Israel was gathered back together and created a new nation again. All right? So in 1948, for many of us who follow prophecy, we're thinking, hey, that's the start. The restoration of Israel is the start of God preparing them to be ready for when the Lord comes back. But uh, re replacement theology has the church inheriting all of God's blessings. And it has Israel enduring all the curses. They don't see it the way dispensation is still. So I want to talk about Israel being restored. Okay. And what, why is that important to us? As we get ready to study about the rapture. Okay. First of all, the deserts have blossomed. This is a real live picture not live. I mean, this is a real picture, modern picture, <laughs> of a desert that has bloomed. And the scripture tells us in Amos, he says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit, and I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of that land. That I have given to them, says the Lord your God. Amos talks about this. The fulfillment of prophecies is starting to happen at the end times. So we go further and we, we realize that the Bible is clear. Israel will be restored as a nation. We see that in our own time, 1948. Do you know before 1948, nobody for 1,948 years ever thought Israel would ever come back and be a nation again. No one thought about that. Then after World War II, and then there was a restoration of Israel. It happened. It wasn't easy. They've had a lot of, a lot of hard times, you know, several battles. Um, but there's coming a day in which the Bible says that they will all be converted to Jesus as their Messiah. You know that. There's, a, there's actual promise that there's going to be a day in which in a day, the entire nation. Now, I don't know what that means, every individual, but I do know it means the nation will be converted to Jesus as their Messiah. And the scripture we get for that is out of the New Testament. It's not out of the Old Testament. It's the New Testament in the book of Romans. And the book of Romans says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved as is written the deliverer will come to Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So there's a time called Jacob's trials and there's a tribulation is coming for Israel. That's what the tribulation is for if you haven't thought about it. Tribulation is not for the rest of the world, although the rest of the world is going to be involved in all of this tribulation, but it's for refining and making precious Israel. So why the tribulation? Am I going too fast? Because I'm getting excited and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speed up. I'm trying to slow myself down. Yeah. Okay. So why the tribulation? Well, one of the major divine purposes for the tribulation is in relationship to Israel. The conversion of Israel into faith in Jesus the Messiah. I notice I didn't say to convert them into becoming members of the church. The church is gone when this happens. The age of the church is over.
when this happens? The remnant, yes, that's a really special word. Remnant is a word, God says, all through time, there are people who fall away from faith, but there's always a small group who maintain their faith. And scripture tells us that they're called the remnant. For example, you know, we had an old prophet in the Old Testament who thought he was all by himself. He was fighting against this evil woman and her evil husband came and he thought, woe on me, I'm the only one working for God's kingdom. And God said, wake up. You have 7,000 others that are also on your side. The remnant, there were 7,000 of them. 7,000 prophets and believers besides just the old prophet. A remnant is God always puts aside his special people and protects them, keeps them safe, prepares them so that when they're needed, they will explode and share, in this case, the Messiah, Jesus. Bible says in the book of Revelation that there's 144,000 Jews who will be the remnant that will be evangelizing all of the Jews around the world and also in Israel. So there's, there's a time coming. Now, this class is not on prophecy, but we might get to it soon. Amen. So in Isaiah, all through Isaiah, it constantly talks about the remnant. And we come across it also uh, in the New Testament as well. So this remnant is, uh, this will take place through the tribulation. But by the end of the seven year period, the entire number of the elect remnant will become converted to Jesus. I don't know what that number is, but it says in one day, there'll be a revelation and thousands and thousands and thousands all through Israel and around the world will come to know the Lord fast. Matter of fact, theologians who study prophecy say that this will be the biggest evangelism ever happened in the history of the world will be during the tribulation. All right. So then what I know, though, is that the Bible says most likely is one third of the Jewish people. A third of the Jewish people will happen. How do I know that? I have a Bible verse for you. Zechariah. Zechariah is one of my favorite guys. And I will put this third into the fire and I will refine them as one refined silver. And I will test them as gold is tested. And they will call upon my name and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is my God. And it will happen. God's word is sure. So that's why I think, yeah, at least a third of them, because this Bible verse here is a promise that at least a third will. So <clears throat> the next week, we're going to study the 70 weeks of uh, Daniel. This is kind of like a get you ready for that, showing you that, first of all, we're unique. The church is not the replacement of Israel. God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for us. And next week, we'll learn a little bit more about that. Any questions? Did I go too fast? Yes. Okay, so the question about the Holocaust was there are preachers preaching what message? What was the, which side are you talking about? Were they preaching the replacement or were they preaching? Yeah, so the replacement uh, theology was definitely being preached. There was a whole group of German pastors, and then you have a few that stood up against it and said, no, this is wrong. God's people are blessed. Don't do this. But there is a large group Worldwide, there were a large group. I told you earlier that we have uh, Reformed theologians. Uh, see, in Luther, which is German, uh, that was, uh, the replacement theology was common. Luther actually wrote a document about that, saying that the church has replaced the, the Jews as the blessing ones for God. So... Yeah. 
So the question is, are there denominations today that are preaching replacement theology? It's big. There is a huge push even into the Baptist church to have this doctrine being taught. Okay, so yes, there are modern day denominations that are teaching that the church replaces Israel and no longer should you be supporting Israel. And I saw in the Southern Baptist Convention there was a group that was trying to get that a doctrine into the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. It was it was voted out, but it, it almost passed. Okay, so uh, because people are not studying their Bibles. If you don't study the Bible, if you just go along with whatever the pastor says, and you don't check it and make sure, you're likely to be herded like sheep. <laughs> and so that's the reason why it's important that we, we study the scriptures to show ourselves approved. Okay, any other questions? Well, I'm going to let you out a few minutes early then, and uh, we'll close in prayer. Father, I pray that your word be accurately taught in this church, that you continue to bless Brian and Toby and Scott and our other pastors, that we would stand up for the word of God, and that we would be faithful to teaching the word accurately. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue our study that we're doing in Thessalonians here and getting some of these excursions on the side to give us some foundations. So that when we get back into Thessalonians, we can understand now why the uh, saving us from the wrath to come is an important doctrine that we need to understand. And why is the church going to be saved and others are not? What's that all about? I pray, Lord, that you would continue to reveal that to us and that you will be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.